Hi, folks. Steve Adubato here. Listen, we do not do enough to acknowledge, to recognize, to honor our public school teachers, our educators. This is part of our, uh, the, actually, the final part of our Teacher Appreciation Week, and we're honored to welcome a very distinguished, distinguished panel. Uh, Aquaeus Kelly is a fifth grade math and science teacher in the New, Br New Brunswick School District. Dr. Christine Ruth is a seventh and eighth grade special education teacher in Atlantic City, New Jersey, and co-founder of the Atlantic City Collaborative for Educational Equity. And finally, Kayla Khaled is a high school Spanish teacher in Union County. I want to thank all of you for joining us on Teacher Appreciation Week. Uh, Aquarius, let me ask you, you got into teaching because? I got into teaching because I, I felt it's a great avenue to promote social change, social justice, and prepare students for the future and prepare students for a, a better future, a bright future, and a just future. This your third year of teaching? This is my fifth year. Fifth, I apologize. Is this what you thought it would be? I learned how to fall in love with the challenge, Steve. And <laughs> I what that. I... What I mean by that is my first two years were very challenging, very difficult. And then However, COVID hit. Then COVID hit. But believe it or not, uh, due to COVID remote instruction, I was given time to work from home and, and really assess my strengths and what I need to do to create systems that would allow me to provide students with the best support to move forward in their learning. Well said. Let me ask you, uh, Christine. You got into teaching because? I've always been uh, a born teacher. So even as a little kid, uh, teaching my younger sisters. So it's something I always wanted to do. And especially working with kids with special needs, uh, just really feeling like I can make a difference. Talk more about that. Why children with special needs? Well, part of it is my own personality that I just love coming to the classroom every day and knowing that I can't expect anything to be the same as it was the day before. It's um, so not, that, is it? <laughs> it it's never not. is, no. Um, so that sense of creativity, that spontaneity, um, you know, that really keeps me on my toes and it, it's interesting to me. So I've been doing this for a long time and still love it. Um, but also the relationships. So having a smaller group of students that I really get to know them and their families and uh, watch them progress academically, socially, um, you know, and as human beings is, uh, is really a gift for me. Well said. Uh, Kayla, you did not think that I would not ask you the same question, right? <laughs> when, did um, you know, when did you know that you wanted to teach? Wow, that's a really good question. Um, I think that I knew I wanted to teach when I went to college and had some amazing professors. And it opened up the idea that education can be so much more than what I was um, introduced to from K through 12. And being part of that was the goal. Let me ask you this, though. I'm going to stay with you on this, Kayla. COVID, again, we're taping going into May 2022. This is, uh, again, part of our Teacher Appreciation Week. To what extent has COVID, the reality of COVID, the challenges, the difficulties around COVID impacted your view of teaching and of education overall? I think COVID uh, definitely changed how things were done, but it's all about evolution, right? And as an educator, you just learn how to change and what needs to be done. And you do what needs to be done. You are in this privileged space where you have students in front of you and they're there for what you're ready to give them. So yes, it is challenging. Yes, it is difficult. But education and teaching always is. Always. And Aquarius, along these same lines, uh, you've offered quote, or you told our producer, Georgette, that uh, you offer flexible timelines for students completing assignments. Why do you do that and how does it work? Well, I feel it's important for us as educators to prioritize proficiency over pacing. That's one of the tensions within education is, OK, we have to teach students this, but within this time, right? And I feel that it can work throughout the school year meaning we have four marking periods. So although an assignment 
should be due at this date, it doesn't mean that students shouldn't have time to revise it and improve upon it. And that doesn't mean that I can, as an educator, go back to the grade book, open it up and revise the grade because that's where the true learning is, is allowing students multiple attempts to refine and revise their learning. That's so interesting. Yeah, uh, Dr. Ruth, let me ask you, and I, we're talking to your colleagues about adapting, pivoting, adjusting, and you could talk about that in the abstract, but then the reality of COVID makes it such a requirement. Let me ask you, how do you, to what do you believe, to what degree do you believe teaching and education overall has significantly changed forever because of COVID or am I overstating it? Mm, I, I wish you were in some ways. I think, um, I think in some ways we've held to a lot of the traditional things that maybe we could let go, you know, speaking to what Aquaius mentioned that that kind of flexibility and meeting kids where they are instead of, you know, um, having inflexible rules for how things should be at school. Um, I think that should be forever changed, you know, that we're the, the children are our focus and their mm. needs are the focus rather than, you know, what the adults want. Mm. Along those same lines, to what degree do you believe, uh, Christine, students, and again, this is not across the board and I don't want to be cavalier about this, but students have been traumatized. Teachers have been traumatized. Other people in other professions, but we're talking about kids right now, students. In what ways do you believe, uh, Dr. Ruth, that students, not across the board, but many of them, and, and more so in certain communities, um, disproportionately black and brown, more challenged economically, to what degree and in what ways are they traumatized? Have they been traumatized? Well, uh, well we learned, uh, we were learning a lot about trauma before COVID hit. And then um, once COVID got here, you know, I, I think we, we continue to talk about um, the trauma that kids have endured from COVID itself. First of all, that many of my students have lost, you know, know someone that died from COVID or lost someone in their family. Um, but then on top of that, we've been kind of ignoring this collective trauma of COVID and just moving forward. You know, that state testing is happening and, you know, the curriculum is moving forward and yet kids are struggling. Um, you know, I think there's the trauma of not being with their friends for, for two years, of not socializing, of not practicing things academically, um, of not knowing what was going to happen next. So even, you know, even for us as adults, you know, that, that unknown um, was traumatizing to all of us. And I think we'd rather yeah. feel as if, oh, things are normal, let's just get back to normal, but uh, we have to process it first. You know, along those lines, Kayla, I want to follow up on something Christine said. You know, we're, we tape a whole range of shows during the day, and um, we built this home studio, and we're fortunate to be able to do that. Not everyone is able to do what we're doing right now, but our daughter, who happens to be in the sixth grade in public schools here in Montclair, just happened to be home and before she's running out to a, a softball game that she's playing. And I went down, and I saw her, and I... And I said, and I started talking to Olivia, tell me what you were, and I, what you were doing at school today. She goes, dad, I have to run. I've got a softball game. I've got to change. And I realized that she's moving very quickly. And then I try to talk to her at the end of the day about what's going on as she's doing her homework. And, and it's great. And it's great seeing her engaged and involved and, and active. And trust me, there's a question here. What could and should we as parents be doing advice from educators to help our kids without getting them to relive every part of their day in micromanaging. Please, uh, on that, Kayla. Having those conversations with, those, with your children, making sure that they know that you're open and available, just giving them the opportunity to highlight what they want to highlight and maybe open up and have those conversations when they feel like having those conversations. Just being there for them, allowing you, allowing them to use you almost like a sounding board or to just be present that makes such a big difference and that it may not feel like enough as a parent because i know but you know as a parent as a parent it, it definitely doesn't feel like enough i feel like i want to do more um you know i see what's going on and i want to jump in but they're doing so much better than i feel like i would have done in that scenario and 
they just need us to be there for them. And that makes a big difference. Well said. Uh, Aquaya, same question. Advice for us from a teacher's, from an educator's perspective is so valuable for all parents watching right now, please. I mean, from an educator's perspective, access to what our children, our students are learning is more available than we may think, right? Meaning as a public school educator, all of our curriculum and learning standards, that's what we call them, are available online at the New Jersey Department of Education website. So if you wanna hop in, as, as Kayla mentioned, hop in and help out some. So we as parents should be going on that website looking for what, Aquarius? So if I'm a if I'm a father and I want to help my, you mentioned you have a daughter in the sixth grade, She's, correct? Yeah, yeah. Sixth grade mathematics, New Jersey Department of Education, grade six learning standards. You see everything that the teacher is required to teach. Along those lines, though. Yes. I could, <laughs> I often, one of the dangers in asking your child, son, daughter, whomever, uh, can I help you or with your homework? When she starts talking about math and science, I'm lost. If it's social studies and history, I'm in the game. Translation, um, should we actually be trying to help them by subject matter or only focusing? Because I can't help in math. I can do something in some other areas. What's too much involvement, uh, Aquaeus, and then Christine? Well, too much involvement, I would say, is uh, telling our children, our students, the answer. But we can <laughs> don't develop. Do that, right? yeah, we, and don't we, write the essay for them. Yeah, we, we can develop, as family members, caretakers, we can develop a line of questioning to assist our, our children, our students with the process. And we can work alongside teachers in doing that. We need I to believe do that. That, Please. that is possible. Doug. Dr. Ruth, jump in. I think the greatest benefit of understanding the curriculum is knowing what's really happening in the classroom and then being able to talk about it. There's been a lot of misinformation lately about what is being taught in our classrooms, um, you know, whether that's in health class or in, in other classes, but the curriculum is published for everyone to look at. So it does give you a clear picture on exactly what the topics are that will be covered. Technology in and of itself impacts our ability to connect or not connect. And we're at the mercy, Aquaeus, of technology, particularly if you're in a hybrid or remote situation. And we will be back for those who think, oh, now we're in the classroom forever. That's great. And that's, let's count our blessings. But as someone who's taught on the higher ed level and teaches seminars on leadership, some are remote, some are in person, some are in person with people remote, and you're at the mercy of technology. Aquaeus, talk to us about that and how you have dealt with that. So being at the mercy of technology, as, as you mentioned, Steve, uh, it's a reality that we just live with, that we have to learn to live with, regardless of any industry. Luckily, there are ways and means to get the devices that we need, whether it's through grants or uh, through partnerships. And we, we have to find a way to, to stay connected because when we're not when we're not, we, we do lose traction. The, the, the term teacher burnout is used a lot. Um, Christine, how, what advice would you have for your colleagues in education to fight and to fight teacher burnout and prepare to not burn out, whatever the heck that means? Please, Christine. Well, one of the things that's helped me is, is being able to talk about uh, what's important to me in education and talking about equity and talking about the things that um, sometimes we're talking about what's missing. Um, so being more of, I, I would even go as far to say as to be an activist and to be someone who's promoting what we need in the classroom rather than, you know, a lot of times what happens to teachers is that we take whatever comes our way and we don't often have a voice to speak up about it. Um, and we've been really good at it. So whatever's, whatever's thrown our way, we usually, we accept it, we figure it out, we move on. Um, and I think sometimes that's been damaging that, you know, we've, we're now at the point where we're all shouldering so many responsibilities 
Um, and so being able to collectively, whether that's with our union or with our friends or with the people we work with, even with our students and, and even with our administrators, because they're overloaded as well, um, to be able to speak up. Sorry for interrupting you, but I got a couple seconds left. Kayla, real quick, um, the reason you love, I'm going to finish on a, on a high note, the reason you still love what you do as a Spanish teacher in Union County is? because there is no better job. I mean, I get to be with students and people that are shaping the way they think and trying new things. And I get to meet the most amazing human beings in the world. What a better job than that. You should take that bottle for commercial promoting education and, and teaching. So Kayla, thank you. Christine, thank you. Aquaeus, thank you. This, I could not think of three better educators to celebrate and, and conclude, if you will, Teacher Appreciation Week. We wish you and all of your colleagues in uh, education the best. Thanks, everyone. Teacher Appreciation Week. Stay with us. Think Tank with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding has been provided by the New Jersey Education Association, NJ Best, New Jersey's 529 College Savings Plan, the Turrell Fund, supporting Reimagine Child Care, New Jersey Sharing Network, Prudential Financial, Summit Health, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, and by NJM Insurance Group. Promotional support provided by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association and by New Jersey Monthly. Hi, I'm Dr. Sharif El Nahal. Did you know that there are nearly 4,000 New Jerseyans waiting for a life-saving transplant? And 67% of those people are people of color. Just one organ and tissue donor can save eight lives and enhance the lives of over 75 people. Let's come together to raise awareness in our diverse communities. Donation needs diversity. You have the power to make a difference. For more information or to become an organ and tissue donor, visit www.njsharingnetwork.org.